That's what we're talking about here. That doesn't sound proportional to me. That doesn't sound like copyright damages that sufficiently deter a crime and nothing more. This is Malibu Media versus Najia Khan. Now, this is already a little bit weird because courts would normally grant a protective order and this should be Malibu Media versus John Doe. So either Najia Khan has either volunteered their name be public on this case or didn't want to pay or move for a protective order. We would normally ask the court to grant the anonymity of the John Doe. There's also a good chance that the judge disagreed that a protective order was warranted. However, it's normal for the parties in these cases to agree to such a protective order. So without looking that up, I don't actually have that information. I'm not saying anything about why it's not granted, just that it's worth noting that if you find yourself in one of these cases, you can make a motion and ask for your name not to be on the thing. So this is a memorandum opinion and order where Malibu Media, the plaintiff, has moved to dismiss the defendant's counterclaims. Normally, a defendant only answers the complaint, says that they deny the allegations, and maybe offers some defenses that we call affirmative defenses, that if they completed the copyright infringement, then the defense somehow negates the copyright infringement. Like, fair use is an affirmative defense. You are using the copyright, so you have committed infringement, except there's an affirmative defense called fair use, where it, which is different from a factual defense of I didn't do it. So an affirmative defense is I did it, but, and a factual defense is, is like I didn't do it, or, or uh, I wasn't, I didn't have the capacity to do it, or I was mentally incapable of, of forming the intent to commit the crime. However, copyright infringement is what we call a strict liability offense. It is a crime, but we're not talking about that in this case, but it would be a strict liability civil offense. If you completed the copyright infringement, it doesn't matter what your intentions were. They do take intentions into account in the damages portion, but not in the did you do it portion. So that's different from most crimes, like a crime of murder, for example, would require a criminal intent, would require you to have a mind uh, in your mind that you wanted to murder somebody. If you accidentally murdered somebody and you didn't, you didn't think of it, that's not called murder, that's manslaughter. So for the reasons stated herein, plaintiff's motion is granted in part and denied in part. This case is one of a deluge of cases brought over the years by plaintiff Malibu Media against named and anonymous defendants for illegally downloading and distributing its copyrighted adult films in violation of the Copyright Act. Malibu brings the instant action against the defendant Najia Khan, alleging Khan utilized a BitTorrent file distribution network to copy and distribute eight of Malibu Media's copyrighted works without consent. In response, she asserts 15 affirmative defenses and two counterclaims. The first counterclaim is for a declaratory judgment of non-infringement, and the second counterclaim is for abuse of process. Khan also requests that the court find the plaintiff has misused its copyrights and that the copyrights should thus be unenforceable. You remember this from the wargaming case, if you misuse your copyright enough, there's sort of a really high threshold to this, but if you truly misuse your copyright, you're not enforcing it for copyright purposes, instead you're enforcing it for some other purpose that's not related to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, promoting the sciences and useful arts, and other, you know, core copyright purposes, then you can actually lose your right to enforce the copyright at all against anyone. Malibu Media now moves to dismiss on Khan's counterclaims uh, and her request that this court determine Malibu misused its copyrights. So those are separate things. The court could find uh, that, which we saw before, it said it was a partial grant, partial denial. Some of these things are going to be granted, some of these things are going to be denied. So we know what 12b-6 is, or at least if you've been following this channel for a very long time, you may know that 12b-6 is a motion to dismiss. It challenges the sufficiency of the complaint to state a claim that a court can recognize as a legal claim and that the court has a remedy for. So it's one thing if you have an injury, but if there's no legal remedy for that injury, sorry, you don't have a claim. You don't have a remediable claim. So that's the 12b-6 motion to dismiss. These pleading standards require that a plaintiff's complaint only make out a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief sufficient to put the defendant on notice, 
In this case, they're saying fair notice. It's always fair notice. Uh, that's due process. Fair notice of the claim and its basis. In other words, the defendant has to be able to prepare their defense. So it should be clear enough that they can say, okay, I've got to prepare a copyright infringement defense. They say the copyright infringement was in, committed via BitTorrent, so that's I've got, to, I've got to prepare for that kind of a defense. As long as they can say, see that, and there's also a remedy for it, it survives a motion to dismiss. When considering a motion to dismiss, the court accepts the well-pleaded facts as they are alleged and draws all possible inferences, in other words, any equivocation, any ambiguity, any vagueness, in the movement's or the plaintiff's favor. Not movement, the non-movement, uh, uh, the, the, the non-moving party. You're trying to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint. Um, in this case, they're dismissing her counterclaims, which is why it gets sort of weird. The, the defendant is now the counterclaim plaintiff. And if you try to go through a complaint and substitute all these words, it gets really tough. So we're going to continue to call the Ma uh, Malwa Media the plaintiff and Najia Khan the defendant. Um, but we're talking about Najia Khan's counterclaims in which she is the plaintiff. Mm. So it's, it's a strange thing. Malibu argues that Khan's first counterclaim for a declaratory judgment is redundant and should be dismissed because it addresses the same issues that Malibu presents for adjudication in its complaint. Khan contends that her counterclaim should stand because it will enable her to seek attorney's fees and costs if Malibu's case is dismissed, and two, it will clear her name. These arguments will be considered together. This is a normal procedure for Malibu Media, and I want to take a moment and talk about this. They don't want you to have a declaratory judgment claim in there because it crosses over a threshold where Malibu can now no longer dismiss the complaint without the judge addressing the fees and costs issue. A lot of times Malibu will dismiss the case after they've conducted a basic investigation. We can argue all day over whether they have that right to conduct that basic investigation on the facts that they've alleged, but practically speaking, the judges do grant these things and people do go to court and they do have to fight. And then somewhere along the way, Malibu either gets cold feet or decides it's not worth it, or maybe their evidence isn't strong enough and they dismiss the case. Well, under U.S. law, under copyright law, the prevailing party is supposed to get their fees and costs. And that fees, those fees and costs, we learned a few weeks ago, are limited to attorney's fees and um, court costs and transcript fees, but not expert witness fees, not investigatory fees, not travel costs, not time off work costs, that kind of thing. We used to think that that was it. The Supreme Court in Rumini Street v. Oracle said no, mm. just attorney's fees, transcript, there's like six categories, and that's basically what applies in copyright cases. So the Mal Malibu media doesn't want to have to pay any of those costs. They want to be able to conduct their investigation without having to reimburse you for your legal fees and things under 17 U.S.C. 505. That's what they're trying to avoid here. It is important to note that the court has broad discretion in considering and granting a declaratory judgment. So courts can, can vary. Is, is what, the, what the court is saying. Khan's counterclaim is redundant in that it repackages her denial of copyright infringement. Nevertheless, that counterclaim seeks more than just declaratory relief. Section 505 of Title 17 of the U.S. Code provides that attorney's fees may be awarded to a prevailing party in a copyright infringement claim. But when the plaintiff voluntarily dismisses its copyright claim without prejudice under Federal Rule Civil Procedure 41A, the defendant is not considered a prevailing party. See Cadkin v. Luce, a Ninth Circuit 2009 case. In this vein, Khan asserts that her counterclaim offers relief that cannot be obtained through Malibu Media's copyright infringement claim. In the, in the case that she cites, another Malibu case, the court found that if Malibu Media's claims prove meritless, it can voluntarily dismiss the suit without prejudice which, and avoid an award of attorney's fees to the defendant. Therefore, Khan argues, allowing her counterclaim to stand will ensure that the copyright claim reaches the merits, thereby affording her an opportunity to obtain relief in the form of attorney's fees and clearing her name. Malibu disagrees, re uh, relying on a Sixth Circuit Malibu Media case to argue that Khan's counterclaims offer no useful purpose and should be dismissed. But in that case, the Recupero case from 2017, the defendant similarly sought declaratory judgment that he did not infringe on Malibu's copyright. That defendant also argued that his counterclaim would secure an award of attorney's fees if Malibu moves for voluntary dismissal. 
the court was not persuaded, reasoning that the Copyright Act awards attorney's fees to the prevailing party without regard to whether the defendant has asserted a counterclaim. On that basis, the court concluded that the counterclaim did not offer a useful purpose and affirmed dismissal of the counterclaim as redundant. This court declines to follow the Sixth Circuit's approach. It is true that the Copyright Act awards attorney's fees to the prevailing party, but to prevail requires an adjudication on the merits. To reiterate, Malibu Media can voluntarily dismiss the action before the court reaches final judgment. In allowing the counterclaim to proceed, however, Khan can still pursue a final judgment. It bears mentioning that damages for copyright infringement in this case and others is significant. Moreover, the potentially embarrassing nature of the alleged copyright violation can provide grounds for abuse. There is tremendous pressure for a defendant to settle, even if the case is meritless. Khan's counterclaim will offer protection should she choose to challenge Malibu Media's case on the merits instead of submitting to settlement. As she points out, it also affords an opportunity for her to clear her name. Accordingly, Malibu Media's argument fails. Malibu Media nevertheless contends that it will be unduly prejudiced by having to litigate duplicative issues. The court disagrees. Malibu will be required to answer Khan's counterclaim, but that imposes a negligible burden. And for all its intents and purposes, the claims will be litigated as one, with an opportunity for Khan to pursue her counterclaim and Malibu to decide to dismiss its own claim. Malibu will suffer no prejudice, and Khan's counterclaim for declaratory judgment withstands dismissal. Now, on to abusive process, though. This might be a different story. They contend that the abusive process counterclaim fails because an abusive process claim must allege an ulterior purpose and an act in the use of a legal process that is not proper in the regular prosecution of proceedings. A bald allegation that the suit was commenced and prosecuted for an ulterior purpose cannot satisfy the independent act requirement. Khan must allege with some specificity an act in the course of process which itself evidences the ulterior purpose, and as such, an act may not be inferred from an improper motive. Khan neither responds nor raises any arguments for why her abusive process counterclaim should withstand dismissal, thus the court will rely on Khan's assertion in her answer. Khan asserts Malibu used lawfully issued process for an ulterior or illegitimate purpose as part of an attempt to obtain results not intended by law, namely to extract money from defendant by leveraging the suit as a means of possible embarrassment. So based on that foregoing, Khan contends that Malibu abused legal process, but she fails to plead any facts supporting the proposition. The, the, the conclusions that she state are, are mere conclusions and do not raise a right to relief above the speculative level. That's from Bell Atlantic v. Twombly, one of our jurisdiction cases, minimum contacts cases. But even if Malibu brought the instant suit to seek settlement, the, that pursuit does not constitute an ulterior motive. Parties seek to settle suits all the time. So they fail on the abusive process, and they probably fail on misuse of copyright. Let's see. Uh, to provide context, Khan's request was not listed as a separate counterclaim, rather it's listed as a type of relief Khan seeks in pursuit of counterclaims. Malibu's sole argument to deny Khan's request is that its copyright claim has merit, and it seeks to protect its works that are protected under copyright acts. The merits of Malibu's copyright claim are beside the point. The court not need consider them to reach a conclusion. Khan's request for copyright misuse seeks no affirmative relief other than a determination that her affirmative defense is meritorious. For this reason, the request is not appropriately a counterclaim and should not be construed as such. Accordingly, if construed as a counterclaim, it is dismissed. The court notes, however, that Malibu Media does not move to strike any affirmative defenses, so Khan's affirmative defense for copyright misuse stands. And that is how the case of Najia Khan, Malibu Media versus Najia Khan, got to be a case where, which stands for the, uh, the premise that a declaratory judgment helps the defendant reach fees and costs should they prevail. Now, you, you can sort of guess, if you followed some of our recent stories on Prendo Law, you can sort of guess why, we're, why Aaron Russell would allege copyright misuse and abusive process. The Prendo Law debacle is what we're concerned about the most. If it turns out that Malibu Media doesn't own its copyrights, or if it turns out that it's ceding the copyrights to BitTorrent, um, if this later comes to light, these, I mean, these are allegations that I'm, I'm not asserting these with any factual basis. We don't, we have not been able to investigate. However, these are plausible 
concerns. So if it later came out that those things were true, an abusive process or misuse of copyright action is absolutely maintainable, in my humble professional opinion. Mm. But as it stands now, no one has been able to prove that Malibu Media or Strike Three Holdings are really anything like Prenda Law. John Steele and Paul Hansmeier and Paul Duffy were doing something much more illegal and and anything remotely or, or anything on the threshold of either illegality or or, or you know improper process, it, Malibu and, and Strike Three seem to be trying to stay on the legal side of the line so that they can keep their copyright uh, enterprise going. And we can morally and ethically disagree with that all day, but so far it is not a violation of a lawyer's rules of professional conduct. It is not an abusive process. It is not a misuse of copyright. It is not something that can be quashed, at least not without additional salient facts. Uh, it is it is it is allowed to continue. And what what the problem, the main problem, the, the way that this would be solved, I think, is if Congress simply ratcheted down the statutory damages said that if you commit online piracy, your damages can be no more than a certain amount for costs and a certain amount for the infringement. Let's say three times the average sale price of the thing. You can't say retail price because then they'll just jack up the retail price. Mm. But if you said, like, if this thing sells for $20 or if this thing sells for a subscription fee or whatever, the most you're allowed to get is three times the subscription fee plus $500 for attorney's fees. Mm. That would make each one of these cases still expensive, but also not many thousands of dollars per case. If you take a case, let's, let's say an example, because I'm not allowed to reveal confidential settlement numbers. So let's take public numbers. If you take a case where there were 50 infringements, five zero infringements, the minimum damages under the United States Copyright Act is $750 per title. So you're talking about $37,500 for, uh, for for 50 acts of copyright infringement. 37000 that's, that's, that's someone's annual salary. That's like an average annual salary in the U.S. before taxes. Mm. Then the judges actually multiply that by three because this is considered a willful act. Remember I said copyright's a strict liability crime? The damages part is where we consider willfulness or intent or whatever. Well, yeah, they consider it and they multiply it by three if it was a willful act. And then there was a guy, we talked about Brian White, B-R-Y-A-N. We made a video on him. He revealed his own name. Um, he he um, committed the copyright infringement allegedly and then lied about it. And the judge multiplied his damages by another 10 times. So he went from 750 a title to $22,500 a title. <laughs> so Sorry. that's what we're talking about here. That doesn't sound proportional to me. That doesn't sound like copyright damages that sufficiently deter a crime and nothing more. They, that seems like a money grab or a, a, a tremendously disparate number. It's not as absurd as the trillion dollars that Spotify got sued for or whatever, but uh, it's it's quite absurd in my humble opinion. And I think Congress should do something about that, but you see exactly how much power I have to sway Congress. Thank you for joining us. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And joining me in the studio today is Ms. Kelly. Brandon and Tactical was here for a little while. Yes, Gromit. <laughs> Lu Lucy's somewhere, Penny's somewhere, the Minion is here with us. All of you are here with us. Thank you very much for joining me. We, of course, are a community-supported channel, and you can support us on patreon.com slash ljfrench or twitch.tv slash lawfulmasses. We are also seeking approval for our join button on YouTube, and I'm not sure why, since you're supposed to get that at 30,000 subscribers, why it's not available to us, but we are making that inquiry. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters for April 2019, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mantain, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Aspernari, Snorri Vizotsky, Sean McNamara, and Atarek. And thank you to the several hundred $5 plus supporters and the rest of the supporters as well. The $5 plus supporters will be crawling on the screen of the videos and everyone will be in the description as well. Anyway, love you all. That's our show. Have a good one. Bye.